Hi, thank you for joining me, Emily, on Temple Not Made by Hands. Today's episode, Who's Your Daddy? Who is your daddy? Are you found in Christ Jesus with your identity anchored in him? In today's episode, we're going to talk about that. We're going to see the value of being a child of God and then how important it is to keep that identity, to remember who you are in the face of anything and what you do in the mundane matters. So we're taking a look at Nehemiah chapter 7 and at this point in the story Nehemiah wants to do a registry of the people but then he finds one. He finds one that was already made um, from the first wave of captives who returned. So in 7.5 it says, God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people that they might be registered by genealogy and I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and were found written in it. So he found the book, they were already written in it and this parallels um, the registry that was made that we can uh, see in Ezra 2. So this was the list of people that came in the first wave of people who returned. So if you read Jeremiah 52, that's going to give you a good summary of um, the breakdown of this nation and that it happened in phases. It happened in three different sages over a 16 year period. And then there was a systematic breakdown where they first targeted the children, then the government, making the government very unstable. And then in that third and final stage, it was on everybody's doorstep. It was on everybody's doorstep. It affected everybody. They tore down the homes. They tore down the temple and destroyed it. They set everything on fire. And then they took the remaining of the captives um, or killed them. You see, God had given instructions at this point, by the time these things were happening, because he had already decided that he was turning this nation over for his judgment, and he raised King Nebuchadnezzar up for that purpose. And he told the people to defect. And then those that were fighting were fighting against God and died fighting. And then those that defected were carried away captive and scattered into the other nations. Really, in short, for the sole purpose of preserving the gospel and raising up a priesthood. So 4,600 were taken captive. But this first wave of return, we get a number of how many returned. And this was only in the first wave. In the first wave, we have 42,360 plus 7,337 servants plus 200 singers. So that's more than 50,000 people just on the first wave that returned. But mixed into that group were those that had forgotten their identity. And then we can read about that in Nehemiah 61 through 66. And it said that these who came up could not identify their father's house. They came up, so when it was time to be registered and they wanted to find their name in the book, it was not there. They were not in the registry. And then when you go to six, verse 64, it says, These sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. And the governor said to them that they should not eat of the most holy things till a priest could consult with the Urim and the Thurm. Uh, Thuman. So they were not invited to the table to eat and their names were not found in the book because what we do in the mundane matters. All of us wear different hats 
and that is okay as long as they remain hats. We wear hats of mother and father or son and daughter. We wear hats of employee or boss or even get engulfed in activities that are okay, wrestling or running, whatever it is. But when that becomes our identity, when that becomes our identity, that is a problem. Who, if our identity is found in Christ, then that's where it remains, even if we lose a hat, because that hat's not who we are. It's a function that we're allowed to function in that can be taken away. But who are you? Who are you? Because nobody can take that away. You can only surrender it by forgetting who you are. We are a child of God first. That is where our identity is found. So we get a glimpse of what happened in the first chapter of Daniel. Daniel was in that first wave of people that was taken captive when they were targeting the children. And then we see how he responded, or we, we actually see um, how he responded there in that land, in the land and area of the territory. But we also see the things happening to him. What was the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar tried to take from him? His name for each one of those. So we get a glimpse of that, but we see it was a lot more than just these four boys that were um, taken captive, but we do see how they stood. Daniel came in his name meaning, God is my judge. And Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Belshazzar, which means Bel protects the king. Bel is one of the many pantheon of gods that were worshipped there into this land that they were carried off to. Hananiah was there. Hananiah's name means Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh is gracious. And then King Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Shadrach, which means command of a coup, another one of the pagan gods that they worshipped. Then Mishael, his name means who is like God, and it was changed to Meshach, who is like a coup. Then we have Azariah, um, Azariah, which means helped by God. And then Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Abednego, servant of Nebo. So we want to look at the ways that they responded in Daniel 1, 8, 8. They didn't respond by arguing with the king. They did not disrespect his position or try to thwart him in any way. But it says that they purposed in their heart that they would not defile themselves. So they turned away the king's delicacies and got permission to do it, they prayed and committed in their heart who they were going to be. These men were able to stand firm in truth and be bold in faith because they purposed in their heart to serve God. And then with this, they received spiritual gifts and continued in a life of prayer and giving God the glory for every miracle that they saw and every way that God was able to use them there. And it all started in that first encounter when they were carried off on that first day where they had no clue what life was going to be like in this new land. They knew they were in the land of the enemy, but they purposed in their heart. So it wasn't a argument or fighting in the streets or marching the White House, but it was what they purposed in their heart. They knew who their identity was. They knew that they were children of God. And then this was the time where they reaffirmed who they are. So that's what we need to do. What they do in the mundane matters, because there was no point in fighting because God already spoke his word. The prophecy wasn't a good prophecy of when they wanted to hear, but it was God's word and prophecy nonetheless. You will be there for 70 years. And then his instructions were to settle in and build. There's different times in our life. There's times to tear down, to root out, to settle in, to build. 
and then there's times to go back. So Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were told to settle in and build. So that's what they did. But they did it intentionally with their heart purposed in their identity in God. That did not change. They did not forget who they were here. But this group of people that comes in in Nehemiah that we read about, we see that they forgot what they did because um, they married into the they married with people who were serving and worshiping multiple gods. They did not believe in the same God they did. They married them. And then it tells us in these chapters too that they took their names. So that's why they lost their identity. They took on the new names that they were given when they went in there. So they could not identify their father's house because the name wasn't even passed on. They, uh, We are in this world, but we are not of this world. And then if we become like this world, we're going to perish with this world. Revelations 2015 says anyone who is not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. And then Revelation 13 8 and 17 8 says that those who do not have their name written in the book of life will worship and marvel when they see the beast. When they see the beast, when they see the Antichrist who rises to power and they see all that he can do, they will marvel at what he can do and they will worship him. But Revelation 3, 5 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. You see, hell was not created for us. Hell was created for Satan and his angels and for his followers, not for us. Hell was not created for you. It is not God's desire that you go to hell. But the rejection of God will result in that but that was not his purpose as we read in uh revelation 3 5 that he will not blot your name out so think about that for a moment he will not blot your name out from the book of life but he'll confess your name before the father if you overcome if you don't forget your identity if you are clothed in his righteousness he will not blot your name out in order for him to blot it out that means it had to be written there in the first place. If he was going to blot your name out, it would be written there in the first place. So God created you on purpose and with purpose before you were even born. And if you're struggling in your identity, then memorize Psalms 139. Spend time in that whole chapter. But right now I'm only going to highlight verse 16. He said, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. You, your name was written in the book of life before you were even thought of. God desires to blot out your sin, not your name. He will blot your sin out with his own blood. That is the promise that we have from Isaiah 43 and in Acts 13, 19. God wants to blot out your sin, not your name and he uses his own blood to do that clothing you in his righteousness because it's not works that we can do by the flesh but it's based on what he already did and he'll never do anything else about sin it is finished but it's up to us to apply it to come under the protection of it matthew 25 41 tells us hell was created for satan and for his followers not for you, but you have to remember who you are, a child of God. Do not forfeit the truth for a lie, but know who you are. Your name was written in the book of life before 
you were even born. And then um, this thinking of this in light of this, it just reminds me of the parable of the wedding feast that Jesus gives to the people that we find in um, Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. And God, Jesus started the gospel in Israel, in his hometown, and to his own people, but they rejected him. And that's what this parable is liking it to, starting at the beginning. And it said, it was time. They were ready, and he sent his servants out to go tell the people. And it said that um, they were invited, but they were not willing to come. So then Jesus sent out servants again, and he said, tell them again to come. And then it said this group of people, they made light of it. They went their ways, one to their farm, the other to the business, and then they killed the prophets, those who were left standing there. So the first group was just not willing to come. Then the next was too busy, so they made light of it. They have more important things to do. Maybe I'll look at that later, but right now I need to tend to my business or I need to tend to my farm. And then some were just angry at the idea of even mentioning it, that they killed the servants. They killed the prophet, pro, uh, prophets. And then when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt, who burned up the city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Now go to the highways and as many as you find, invite them, invite everybody, invite the good and the bad. So you see, it's not based on our performance or what we did or didn't do. And that's the time frame that we're living in now because those rejected him and God said open it up for everybody from the ends of the earth the highways and the byways the uttermost to the guttermost everywhere in between invite them all the good and the bad the all all of them all are invited you are invited I'm invited to have a seat at his table to celebrate this wedding feast this coming back of Jesus Christ for his church everybody is invited and then here's what's interesting as we keep reading this parable is it says everybody was invited the good and the bad so he said to them or so then the king showed up at the party to see all who would come because now everybody's flooding um this wedding and coming in but now the king comes and he notices one who does not have a garment on and he asks him he said how did you come in here without a wedding gar garment and this man was speechless. He didn't know what to say. And then the king said to the servant, bind him up, put, bind him up, take him away, cast him into the outer darkness where there's gonna be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. So what happened here? The excitement of the building riled everybody up and they all came running and flooding in wanting to build. And in this parable, he didn't have the right garment on. What is the garment? The garment of praise that he gives clothing us in his own righteousness when we receive Jesus as our savior, knowing that he died for our sins, that I am a sinner. I need a savior. Jesus, you are my savior. That is the garment that we need to enter the wedding feast. So just because we showed up with a lot of excited people does not mean that we will find our place at the table if we have not received Jesus Christ as our savior. And then as we see in Nehemiah 7, they came and they wanted to build, but they could not identify their father's house and their name was removed from the book of life. Jesus is the garment of praise that we need to be wearing, clothed in his righteousness, not my own. We are the righteousness of Christ. We're the righteousness of Christ when we've received Jesus. Jesus is my testimony. We all have different stories of how we met Jesus. We all have different stories 
but the same testimony. Jesus is my testimony. He did what I could not do. Would you receive him as your savior and remember who you are, keeping that identity, even in the face of opposition, even in the land of the enemy. Some of us have become so surprised that we're in the land of the enemy. But Satan is the prince of the air. We're told that in his word, but God is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords on his throne still today offering his hand of protection and guide, guidance, leading us all the way home. So I want to finish with these reflective questions. Do you feel that you are standing firm in your identity as a child of God? And if not, what is blocking it? What is blocking it? And then I want to encourage you, spend time in that whole chapter of Psalms 139 because he knit you together in your mother's womb. And then he put your name in that book of life before you were even born. He desires to blot out your sin with his own blood, not your name, not your name, but something will be blotted out because that's also the place where everything we have done is recorded. Our names are recorded, what we've done is recorded, and then our sin is blotted out or our names. So make sure you know which kingdom you are serving and who you belong to. Then the second question, how have you made a commitment in your heart to serve God? In what way have you done that? And then remember that Write it down so you can run with it. Keep account of it, that you do not forget what God said in the face of what you see. And then if you haven't done this, take this time to do it. Make a decision, firm in your heart, purpose in your heart who you will serve this day. If it's the Lord, let it be the Lord. If not, then go serve whatever it is you're gonna serve. But this day choose, who will you serve? Who will you serve? What are you purposing your heart to do? Number three, have you received a spiritual gift from God? If so, what? And then if not, then let's pray that God would reveal those gifts to you. Make sure you're in the fellowship of believers because he calls us and says, as you see the day approaching, don't forget or forsake the fellowship of believers. That day is approaching. And then when we get into the fellowship of believers, that's where also where our gifts start becoming manifest, where we start recognizing I have words of wisdom or words of knowledge or gifts of help or gifts of administration or gifts of hospitality. They start coming to life in the fellowship. So make sure it's a Bible-based believing church that is standing on the word of God and then connect, connect. And then uh, last one, what does God want to rebuild, give back or strengthen in your life? Can you look over your life and see times where uh, things were stripped away from you or you had to uproot things? Um, what is God wanting to rebuild now? What is he wanting to strengthen? From what do you have left that he wants to strengthen in your life to rebuild and reestablish? Is he reestablishing you now? How is God speaking to you this week? Pay attention and purpose your heart to do it. And then let's finish with John 1, 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Don't forget who you are, child of God. Thank you for tuning in. I will see you next time.